We are left with the 1954 libel case in Jerusalem. With the background, Malkiel Grunwald was a Hungarian Jewish part-time journalist who was beaten unconscious and left for dead in a pogrom in Vienna in 1937. This would be very soon before the Anschluss, and uh, it was not a healthy place to be. As soon as he recovered, he took his wife and children to mandatory Palestine, where he bought a small hotel in Jerusalem. Grunwald lost dozens of relatives in the Holocaust. He supported the Irgun, that's the national military organization in the land of Israel, a Zionist paramilitary organization, and he lost a son in the 1948 War of Independence. In the early 1950s, Grunwald sold the hotel. By now he was age 72. He, he'd never learnt to write Hebrew. He could speak it, but he couldn't write it. And his opportunities for employment were very uh, limited. So he began self-publishing a weekly three-page mimeographed pamphlet called Letter to My Friends in the Mizrahi. And some of you might know Mizrahi was the National Religious Party. So he wrote in German. He had his original German document translated into Hebrew, and he distributed by himself 1,000 copies of the pamphlet free, either by mail or by hand in local cafes. His pamphlet attacked corrupt leaders, religious officials who were not worthy of their positions, and greedy public officials. It was a real, it was a ranting uh, pamphlet, and a frequent target were Knesset members from the ruling left-wing Mapai party. As I said, he was right-wing, very right-wing, and so it was quite um, natural for him to target the left-wing Mapai party, which was the party in power, which later became Israel's Labour Party. Mm. Every time someone threatened to sue him, Grunwald issued a public apology and everything was fine. He had a particular interest, of course, in the catastrophe that befell Hungarian Jewry. He was Hungarian. In pamphlet number 51 in 1952, Grunwald wrote, I have waited a long time to expose this careerist, whom I consider, because of his collaboration with the Nazis, an indirect murderer of my dear people. Who is this spokesman for the Ministry of Trade and Industry? Who is this big shot of the Hungarian Jews? Who is this fellow who has been put high on the list of candidates for Israel's parliament by the government party Mapai? This character is Dr. Rudolf Kastner, political adventurer driven by sickly megalomania. For whom on whose account, Dr. Kastner, did you go like a thief in the night to Nuremberg to become a witness for the defense of SS Colonel Kurt Becher, the murderer of Jews, the man who wallowed in the blood of our brothers in Hungary, Kurt Becher, economic administrator of the Gestapo? Why did you save him from the death penalty which he had so richly earned? You flew to Nuremberg to save a mass murderer of Jews. Kastner's deeds in Budapest cost us the lives of hundreds of thousands of Jews. We're talking about a Jew. This is what Grunwald is claiming. We demand an impartial public committee of investigation. Bertie would say a tribunal. <laughs> Kastner must be removed from the politics and from the society of this land. We shall keep this on our agenda until the evil is ended. In terms of rants, that's a very powerful rant. So who was Kastner? Rudolf Israel Kastner was a Jewish Hungarian journalist and lawyer. At the beginning of World War II, he was one of the leaders of the Budapest Aid and Rescue Committee. And this is interesting, which smuggled Jewish refugees into Hungary. Jewish refugees escaping from other countries, <coughs> which made sense because until 1944, in other words, for five years of the Second World War, nothing happened to Hungarian Jews. 
Following the Nazi invasion in, of Hungary in March 1944, this committee helped refugees escaping from Hungary. Between May and July 1944, Hungary's Jews were deported to Auschwitz at a rate of 12,000 people a day. May, June, July, August, um, uh, three months. In three months, hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews who'd lasted five years were sent and, and murdered. Rumors had long circulated that Kastner had not done enough to warn Hungarian Jewry, focusing instead on trying to save a select number of people who escaped from Hungary on the so-called Kastner train. In exchange for money, gold and diamonds, the Nazis allowed this one train with nearly 1,700 notable Hungarian Jews to escape Nazi-controlled Hungary. Kastner himself did not join the train, which included his family, 388 people from the ghetto in his hometown, and another um, 1,200 um, Jews. Kastner himself reached Palestine after the war, and as Grunwald said in his pamphlet, flew back to Europe from what was then uh, Palestine in order to intervene on behalf of this SS um, officer with whom he had negotiated in Hungary. Kastner told the International War Crimes Tribunal in Nuremberg that Becher was one of the few SS leaders who had the courage to resist the Nazi plan for annihilation of the Jews and that he had, in fact, attempted to rescue Jews. I invite you to um, look at some of the evidence. But thanks in part to Kastner's statement, Becher was not prosecuted as a war criminal. Back in Israel, Kastner continued his active role in labor Zionist politics, becoming a spokesman, therefore a civil servant, for the Ministry of Trade and Industry in 1952. And it, he is a civil servant at the time of Grunwald's pamphlet. Following Grunwald's accusations against Kastner, the then Attorney General and Minister of Justice, interesting that um, one person had both posts, not something that we would probably uh, I think was, um, uh, was right in Ireland today. Chaim Cohen felt that the charges were serious enough for the state to pursue Grunwald. The state because Kastner was a civil servant. In Cohen's words, in our new, pure, ideal state with a capital S, a man cannot officiate in a senior position when there is a stain on him not even only a grave suspicion of collaboration, or oh, sorry, or even only a grave suspicion of collaboration with the Nazis. Refusing to back down, Malkiel uh, Grunwald engaged Shmuel Tamir, a young lawyer, himself a former chief of intelligence with the same Irgun, uh, the right wing um, uh, militia, um, which Grunwald had backed uh, to defend him. Tamir, a future justice minister under Menachem Begin, planned to turn the libel case against Grunwald into a case accusing Kastner of collaboration, a bit like what happened later with the um, Irving case, where the defense turned the case round as an attack on the claimant. He also planned to show that the Mapai dominated Jewish leadership in Palestine during the Holocaust had not done enough for the Jews of Europe. This is a claim which has been often repeated, and I'm going to come back to that a little later. Hearings began on the 1st of January 1954 in the Jerusalem District Court before Judge Benjamin Halevi, a single judge, District Court. Tamir accused Kastner of failing to warn the Hungarian Jewish community that they were to be loaded onto trains and taken to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. 
He alleged that Kastner had known about the gas chambers since at least the end of April 1944, but had not deliberately not shared this knowledge that the Jews were not being deported from Hungary to be resettled. This was the official Nazi terminology. In his summing up in Jerusalem, Judge Halevi said, Kastner sold his soul to the devil. Halevi said that by saving the Jews on the Kastner train, while failing to warn others that their resettlement was in fact deportation to the gas chambers, Kastner has sacrificed the mass of Jewry for a chosen few. Earlier we saw how Dr. Daring was awarded a halfpenny in damages in the libel case he brought against Leon Uris. The judge, Judge Halevi, in the Kastner trial, ruled that Kastner had indeed been libeled by Grunwald and awarded Kastner one shekel. Very similar uh, outcomes here. The shock waves from the trial and arguments over whether or not to appeal triggered the fall of the Mapai led Israeli government. Kastner resigned his civil service job and became a virtual recluse. Three years later, March 1957, Kastner was assassinated by Ze'ev Ekstein, a veteran from the pre-state right-wing militia, Lehi. The irony of all this is that in January 1958, less than a year after Kastner was assassinated, the Supreme Court of Israel overturned most of the judgment in the original trial. In a four to one decision, the Supreme Court justices found that the lower court had erred seriously. Supreme Court Judge Cheshin wrote, on the basis of the extensive and diverse material which was compiled in the course of the hearing, it is easy to describe Kastner as blacker than black and place the mark of Cain on his forehead. But it is also possible to describe him as purer than the driven snow and regard him as the righteous of our generation, a man who exposed himself to mortal danger in order to save others. One of the first books written on the Kastner trial was a book called Perfidy by American playwright Ben Hecht. If I'm not mistaken, Michael, you've read that book. Yeah. Um, it's a shocking book. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a counter-rant. It, 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 it is, uh, you know, he, he doesn't pull his punches. Ben Hecht was very well known. He was a scriptwriter, several movies that we would know uh, he'd written. <clears throat> In its shrill anti kastner tone made it an instant bestseller. But, and here's a very important but, it was particularly popular with anti-Zionist Jews. And there's the irony. He was, a, he was a Zionist, Ben Hecht, a very strong Zionist, a right-wing strong Zionist. Yet his attack on the Mapai government and on Kastner was used by many anti-Zionist Jews as ammunition. Hecht accused Mapai of cooperating with the British in their war efforts against the Nazis instead of joining the revisionists, the right wing, in continuing the military struggle for liberation from the British. A very strong claim of collusion between the Jewish leadership in Palestine and the British at the expense of the Jews of Europe. 1994. Israeli author Tom Segev repeated Hecht's accusations in a book called The Seventh Million, The Israelis and the Holocaust. When he says the Israelis, he actually, of course, means the Jewish Palestinians because there was no Israel at the time. Segev claimed that the leaders of the Jewish settlement in Palestine in World War II, and especially David Ben-Gurion, head of the Jewish agency executive, were either shockingly unconcerned or callously instrumental 
in their attitude towards the murder of European Jewry. Now, this, is a, this is a heavy duty accusation. 1997, Shabtai Tevet's Ben Gurion and the Holocaust attacked not just Segev, but the entire coalition of historical revisionists, right-wing critics of Ben-Gurion, left-wing ideologues in Israel and elsewhere, ultra-Orthodox anti-Zionists and post-Zionist new historians. Tevet showed that by repeating each other's distortions, these Jews created the false impression that there existed a formidable body of scholarly literature to sustain their claims. It was like he said it was like a, a vicious cycle, everybody talking about the same people in the same group, and it looked as if, wow, here's a real historical agenda. He pointed out, Tevet, that the Jews in Palestine had no army, no air force, no navy, and no diplomatic corps. They had no means of reliable contact with operatives behind Nazi lines, they had no support from or leverage on the world's governments. They depended on hostile or uncaring British officials in Jerusalem and London for the simplest logistical support. In short, the half million Jews of Palestine were reduced to reading of the slaughter in Europe with clenched teeth. Tevet quoted Ben-Gurion's anguished cry to the nations of the world in July 1944. That's an important date from our point of view because this is just at the height of the murder of Hungarian Jewry. What have, he's talking to the nations of the world, what have you allowed to be perpetrated against the defenseless people while you stood aside and let them bleed to death, never lifting a finger to help? Why do you profane our pain and wrath with empty expressions of sympathy which ring like mockery in our ears? So itself a very powerful cri de coeur. Tevet pointed out that before the Holocaust, it was only the Zionists in the entire Jewish world who told the Jews of Europe to get out while they could. The non-Zionist Jewish left was urging Jews to stay and participate in the anti-fascist struggle. Many of the non-Zionist or anti-Zionist Orthodox Jews were exhorting their flock to put their trust in God. The liberals and assimilationists were confident that the Hitlerite aberration would blow over. So they all fulminated against being taken in by the self-serving doom-mongering of Zionists. Tevet quotes Ben Gurion, 1935, before the Holocaust. The disaster which has befallen German Jewry is not limited to Germany alone. Hitler's regime places the entire Jewish people in danger. Ken Livingstone, one of the nastiest anti-Semites in Britain's increasingly anti-Semitic Labour Party, recently repeated an old claim that Hitler supported Zionism. <laughs> it is a fact that the Jewish Agency's 1933 transfer agreement with the Nazi Ministry of Economics enabled thousands of German Jews to come to Palestine by exchanging Jewish assets forcibly abandoned and confiscated in Germany for German industrial exports. But to equate this with Hitler's support of Zionism um, is a bridge too far. Deborah Lipstadt, who we saw earlier, was sued by David Irving, accused Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt, um, in some circles, would be regarded as a very important philosopher. In other circles, she would have a slightly different reputation. So Lipstadt accused Hannah Arendt and her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, of distorting history because she also implicated the Jews in their own destruction. The writer Ruth R. Visser suggests that the likes of Segev, Hecht, and Arendt seem to be saying, I am not like those petty, narrowly nationalistic Jews who are always whining about their misfortunes to justify their exploitation of others. 
I am a universalist, a member in good standing of the human race, and the proof is that I have slaughtered the holiest Jewish cow of all, the Holocaust, and brought it as a sacrifice with which to expiate myself. Today, she said, we have a name for such people, some of you will know that one of my favorite expressions, self-hating Jews. Let's get back to Kastner. Just as the shadow of the civil war in Ireland still colors Irish politics almost a hundred years later, so the shadow of the Kastner controversy still colors Israeli politics 60 years later. Someone else whom historians still argue over regarding whether he was a saint or a sinner in relation to the Holocaust is, of course, Pope Pius XII. Some of you might recall a book by John Cornwell in 1999 called Hitler's Pope. Cornwell had intended his book as a defense of Pius XII, but as he wrote in the preface, nearing the end of my research, the material I had gathered taking the more extensive view of Pacelli's life, Pacelli was the previous name of the Pope, amounted not to an exoneration, but to a wider indictment. And that was what's so interesting about this book. He went to the archives to which he was given almost first uh, sight in order to prove that Pius had been a good man, and yet he calls his book Hitler's Pope. Now, something similar happened to a British Jewish historian called Paul Bogdanor. Dismayed by how Kastner's name was being used in anti-Zionist propaganda, Bogdanor set out to prove Kastner's innocence. But after 10 years of research, he concluded that everything pointed towards Kastner's having collaborated with the Nazis and having betrayed the Zionist movement and the Jewish people. In his book, Kastner's Crime, Bogdanov says that not only did Kastner know that Hungarian Jews were being sent to their deaths, he actively kept such information secret from other Jews in Hungary and the wider Jewish world. Kastner may not have started out, he says, as someone evil, but when the Nazis occupied Hungary, he became began negotiating with them, and of course one of the people he negotiated with was Eichmann, who was sent to Hungary to uh, make certain that um, 400,000 Jews didn't stay alive. He began negotiating with them and ended up as a collaborator. Bogdanov, however, stoutly refutes the anti-Zionist claim that Kastner was part of a, Jewish con of a Zionist conspiracy with the Nazis to exterminate the Jews of Europe. And he says he was not acting on behalf of the Zionist movement. He was betraying it by feeding his contacts in the free world Nazi disinformation. Kastner, he says, was drawn into this web of collaboration, partly due to his own sense of aggrandizement and vanity, that he was the sole conduit for the Nazis to deal with the Jews of Hungary. And he proves it by saying, Kastner's rescue committee were the only Jews in Hungary who did not have to wear a yellow star. They were the only Jews in Hungary permitted to continue to use their own cars and telephones. Kastner was the only Jew allowed to travel from the capital to the provinces. The Nazis saw how attracted Kastner was to power and they exploited. Ladies and gentlemen, today we looked at three libel trials associated with the Holocaust. In all three cases, the defendants were vindicated. In Israel, passions still run high to this day on the Kastner affair. And although the Eichmann trial was a bigger event, the unresolved question of whether Kastner was a hero or a victim, a sinner or a saint, remains an open question to this very day. Thank you very much.